You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Here's a thought. I agree with a guy who wrote this right after the Civil War, okay? John sees a large burning mass falling to earth like a mountain burning with fire. He's explaining what he sees. He sees an asteroid coming down to earth. J.A. Seiss wrote in the late 1860s, and this is the third edition from 1901, take it as it's written, there's no other way to take it that yields any certain or reliable sense. Making assumptions is a dangerous habit to get into. It can lead to a lot of misunderstandings, confusion, and maybe even a loss of a friendship or two. Even more dangerous, though, is if you begin to make assumptions about what the Bible says. The book of Revelation can seem incredibly weird and confusing at times. It's easy to begin to assign our own meanings to some of the passages. But today, Pastor Ken encourages you to take John's words at face value. Take his words as they are written, and nothing more. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelation chapter 8 as he begins his message, more of his strange work. Okay, we're still in the book of Revelation. We'll be there a while longer. But uh, Lord willing, we'll finish chapter 8. And we're still talking about what we saw in the book of Isaiah is called God's strange work, which is judgment. It's not something that he normally does. So we're going to continue on with more of his strange work as we continue to look at the trumpet judgments. And and we're not going to finish all those. We're going to get through the fourth. But we're going to look at Revelation 8, verses 8 to 13. So we saw the transition. We saw the seventh seal opened of the deed to planet Earth. The Lamb opened it. And then everything started shifting. Everything started changing. There was a shift. Heaven was going from a standing of grace to now it's all about judgment. The angels are no longer going to be involved in reaching others for Christ. Now they're going to be involved in judging the earth dwellers, the people who are on planet earth. So they're serving the Lord, but now they're going to be serving him in judgment. And we're going to see that there are specific angels who have specific jobs that makes it sound like, really, is that all the Lord created him for? Well, yeah, in some cases it is. And we've also discussed before that there are people who think that there's a lot of symbolism in Revelation and they try to make different things into different things. And you can go crazy. I reject it. I just flat out do. I mean, it's a chronology in advance of history, in advance, and different things don't mean symbolic this and symbolic that as what some folks try to build it into. Because once you start going down the road of symbolism, for example, uh, you say that uh, this particular trumpet is in reference to the Roman government. Well, then the, you turn around and open another book, oh, this is in, it's whoever, gov- whatever government you don't like at that particular time that it's in reference to. And it's crazy, but you see that. And then you start having to guess what it is. Every time you come across that, when you don't keep your hermeneutics, that's what that's called, the science of interpretation of the scriptures, it's called hermeneutics. When you start trying to do that, you lose track of where you really are. So it's easier just to say, well, the Bible says a uh, mountain thrown into the sea. Okay, I'm, I'm good with that. How does that happen? What does it look like? But this is a blow-by-blow chronology of history in advance. That's it. John's doing his best to tell us what it is. But remember, his imagery is that of the 90th AD mind, okay? He is not talking to us in a 21st century mindset. He doesn't have that. He comes from an agrarian society, he is Jewish, and he has lived in the Roman Empire. And it's 90 AD. That's his square. So when he tries to explain stuff to us, he's never seen Star Wars. So he doesn't know what that really, you know, he can't explain it that way. He, he says it's like this or it's like that. Uh, so, and we're going to see that. We're going to see metaphor, simile. He, it's all over this book. Now, we also have to remember, and some people who are studying this and have written commentaries, they try and make it sound like, oh, I've just discovered this, that it's all about Rome, or it's all about the Pope. Or I love what it says in Revelation 22.10. The Lord says to John, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. This is not a sealed book, okay? 
don't read into it in some cases. In some cases, yeah, you know, there's, there's terms that we see that are consistent throughout the Scripture, but the context of that also gives us the idea, okay, what does this mean? And in other cases, the context is real simple. He's just saying, this is what's going on. But everybody keeps trying to read into it, okay? So as we read through these in later judgments, the trumpet judgments, you see it show up, it shows up also in the bowl judgments, we're faced with the problem of do we look at it from a literal perspective or a symbolic perspective? And we're going to look at it literally, okay? That's how we look at it, not symbolically. You know, to try and, and, and I've read four or five books that do this, to try to make a mountain into a form of human government and then try and guess what human government that is that's being destroyed. And the sea is the Roman Empire. I mean, give me a break, because that's not what it says. That's not what the scriptures say. Dr. Walford says, then he's actually quoting somebody, where somebody said that the mountain of the third trumpet judgment is the Roman government. It's dropped into the Roman Sea, which is the Roman Empire, and the ships that are destroyed are the church. Really? No, it's not. That's not it at all. But there are some folks who actually go there. So as we continue in the book of Revelation... We also have to remember something else. Now, everything builds upon each other. Remember, we've already gone through seven seals of judgment. And we're in the seventh seal right now, which is the seven trumpets. And everything builds on everything else. So we've already had the great disappearance. That's the rapture. The church is gone. church is in heaven with the Lord. Connected with that is financial upheaval. So you have to keep all this in the back of your mind. You can't look at these judgments as being, well, it's only this. There's other things going on. With the seal judgments, you've had false peace, you've had persecution, slaughter, worldwide war, systematic and systematic ritual execution of believers. And this is before the tribulation even begins. You've had selective famine that impacts everybody but the rich. Okay, And then we've had world war with the fourth seal using weapons of mass destruction killing off one quarter of the world's population post-rapture. We know that they use nuclear weapons because it's described. Well, you get nuclear winter with nuclear weapons. That destroys the ozone layer. It disrupts high-altitude radiation belts. It disrupts the axis of the Earth to the point that it may actually affect the spin of the Earth as well. And then you have pathogen outbreaks, too, and disruption of food sources. And that's just from the fourth seal. And then the fifth seal, we have the martyrs, which is there. And they're wanting to know how much longer is this going to go which gives us the hint this is before the tribulation actually begins because if it had been begun, they would know. But it's after the rapture. And then we have the sixth seal with earthquakes and tsunamis. Uh, we talked about that there's something that everybody sees in heaven that could be a wormhole. We see fallen angels being cast down to earth or meteors, depending upon how you look at it. Visible signs of dimensional portals and activity from a spiritual perspective taking place. And everybody tries to hide from God. Meanwhile, the evangelists are all sealed, and then we see a a scene of what's to come. Oh, and by the way, all insurance companies are bankrupt by now, and the ecology is absolutely kaput. I couldn't think of any other technical way to put it, so that that works for me, okay? And then, of course, the seventh seal, which we're into now, we have silence, incense, prayer, and we shift from grace to judgment, and we get a preview of coming events, and then we start the trumpet judgment. So we've already talked about the first one which was hail, fire, and blood with a third of the earth burned up. A third of the trees, all the green grass, which is possibly supernatural in origin, or it could be the result of global war or the result of a coronal mass ejection because the earth's natural protections are already damaged. So here we go with the next one, okay? Verse 8 of Revelation chapter 8. The second angel sounded, and here's the key. When, When somebody says, and something like, That means, okay, he's trying to explain something to us that he's having trouble explaining to us, right? So he says, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood, and the third of the creatures which were in the sea that had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, other than he, we know he says there's this, it looks like a mountain being thrown into the sea. He, he's pretty straightforward on everything else, right? I mean, that's the way I look at it. It's pretty straightforward. Now, reminder, again, John is writing in 90 AD. And he's using comparatives that he and his readers would be familiar with. 
So in 90 AD, what are his readers familiar with that he can talk about a mountain being thrown into the sea? Mount Vesuvius, exactly, a volcano. He's using experiences that people would know from around him. Now, when he says Great Mountain, he could be thinking Mount Vesuvius. Thirteen years before, in 79 AD, or thereabouts, which was like 12 or 13 years prior to when John's writing, Vesuvius erupted and destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum. And many of the Jews thought that was judgment on Rome for destroying Jerusalem and the temple. And by the way, there's an island that was created too, Prosida, was created as a result of the eruption of Vesuvius. But Vesuvius didn't fall from the sky. It may have looked like that when you're standing in Pompeii and everything's coming at you, but it didn't fall from the sky. It started on the earth. And they think, well, maybe the island being created is thrown into the sea. Yeah, that might make, but it's a familiar image. Everybody had heard about it. They didn't, it didn't show up on CNN, though, in, in 79 AD. Yeah, imagine that. No television. Yeah, no fake news then. <laughs> but it did, everybody knew about it. They'd all heard about it. They'd heard somebody who was there or from someone who was around or, or whatever. So that picture is passing through the reader's mind when they read this. So, okay, uh, we, we are, we're familiar with Vesuvius. We know what happened there. Well, okay, but there are going to be some who have actually read the book of Enoch, and they're, they're going to think back to Enoch 18 where it talks about burning mountains and it's the seven evil angels being held prisoner. And I'm going like, yeah, it's seven stars like great burning mountains about which I inquired. I and mean, when you look at it in context, these are fallen angels held in prison. Okay, that's not it. So that, that's, not the, that's not what these are. Was Vesuvius judgment? I mean, just let's take a quick step backwards. Remember the emperor who was a general and was in charge of the four legions that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple was a guy by the name of Titus Vespasian. He was about 29 or 30 years old when that took place. At the age of 39 in 79 AD, he became emperor of Rome. And he'd been emperor for two months when this little mountain near Pompeii blew up. I think that's kind of interesting. This guy's the emperor. He's also the one that captured the temple. He's the one that took 40,000 Jews, put them into slave labor, and they built the Colosseum in Rome. By the way, while he was emperor, and he only was emperor for two years, there was a Vesuvius with the destruction of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Uh, there was a fire in Rome, and to top it all off, plague. And then he died suddenly, and nobody knows how. Do you think God may have been judging him for what he did? In yeah, could be. Very well could be. We don't know. You just look at that picture, though, and you kind of go, okay. And this is in the head of everybody who's reading what John is writing. They understand this. They know this. And another thing they also know is that when Vesuvius erupted, nobody in Pompeii knew it was coming. It was life as normal. Based on the archaeological discoveries, the guy was still at the gate guarding like normal, and he died at the gate. It was just a normal day. People were doing life, and they were killed when this thing blew up. They ignored all the signs, which is what you're seeing happen here in the book of Revelation. People are ignoring all the signs. So, yeah, I think it's something like that that John's readers would get. It's like, but this is not a massive supervolcano, okay? Because it's going to take out a third of the world. So that would have to be one really big mountain. So, and then, of course, you have those folks who say, well, a mountain is a great organized governmental power destroyed suddenly. Yeah, okay. But thrown into the sea? Well, they say the sea is the chaos of the nations, and a third of the sea life and the sea vessels are toast? I don't know. I don't think so. That's an interpretation that I just don't go with. Some also say, oh, well, it's Babylon. It's pointing back to Jeremiah 51.25, where God says, I'm against you, a destroying mountain. He's talking about Babylon. Who destroys the whole earth? I'll make you a burnt-out mountain. And they say, well, that's what that is. No, Babylon has what, it, it's coming, it's later in the book, and it, it happens rather sudden. This is too soon. This is not Babylon. Here's a thought. <laughs> I agree with a guy who wrote this right after the Civil War, okay? 
John sees a large burning mass falling to earth like a mountain burning with fire. He's explaining what he sees. He sees an asteroid coming down to earth. J.A. Seiss wrote in the late 1860s, and this is the third edition from 1901, take it as it's written, there's no other way to take it, that yields any certain or reliable sense. And he starts going through the list of all the things he's read. What do we want with Aspasian, Alaric, Radagasius, Attila, Genseric, Romans, Goths, Vandals, Arians, Prelates, or the devil? Okay, these are all the different things that people were saying it was. When John tells us it's a fiery, meteoric mass, an aerial mountain, a great towering precipitated from the atmosphere into the sea. It's a great wonder of the day of judgment. Why can't we accept that? That's a good question. So that's what, I, that's what I'm saying it is. I mean, and as you start studying, and I've spent way too much time playing with astronomy, we'll go into some of the things. But the, it's obvious that the people who come up with other answers have never seen the movie Armageddon. You know, the asteroid that's threatening Earth, and, and off they go to... No? Oh. So what you've got is a massive rock. And Henry Morris wrote this. Henry Morris is a scientist. He's also a Bible expositor. A mighty mass of rock hurtling toward the earth, surrounded by combustible gases which ignite as they enter the atmosphere, steered earthward by an angelic host of heaven, is the most logical, likely, physical explanation accessible to us at this time. Makes sense to me. Maybe a giant meteoroid or asteroid or even a satellite, not artificial. He's talking about another moon or something orbiting another planet, could be propelled earthward by cosmic forces that we don't know about. Dr. McGee says it's just a literal mass that falls into a literal sea. Okay? It's an asteroid. One-third becomes blood. Okay? They saw that happen after uh, some of the volcanoes. That's not unusual. The right kind of chemical combinations, that will take place. One-third of all the living literal creatures in the literal sea die a literal death. Nothing is plainer than this. And that's what it says. I mean, John just says, here's what it is. Well, that's what it is, okay? This is an asteroid falling into the ocean, and it causes problems. So we're going to go with the plain statement of the text, which is something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. That's it. We're not going to read anything else into it other than what the text has in it. Are we okay with that? Okay, good. Whether it's an asteroid or a comet, we could argue about that. But the Center for Near-Earth Objects or the Planetary Defense Coordination Office at NASA, these are real entities, uh, won't be able to come to the rescue. They'll tell everybody about it, and they'll get a warning, and I'm sure everyone will be tuned in to CNN watching this thing crash into the ocean someplace. And then it'll suddenly go, zzz, because whatever the camera is is now gone, unless it's a drone. But I'm assuming, every, I'm assuming everybody's going to watch this happen. It's going to happen live on television. And are these things like that? Are they mountains? There are some asteroids that they're monitoring right now that are 20 kilometers in diameter. And they're as big as Manhattan. So, uh, yeah, that's a pretty good size right there. That could cause a lot of problems. So we're going to have a collision, an asteroid or comet maybe, collide with the sea. It'll only be the one impact location, but it's evident that the entire world's going to know about it. People are going to observe it. They're going to see it coming from space. They're going to get the warning. They may even try to shoot a missile down to, to knock it out. It won't work. It's going to spiral to the surface, and everybody's going to see it on television. I mean, they will. The explosion on impact will make an atomic bomb look small because of the energy in this thing. I mean, there's a crater on the Yucatan Peninsula, they say, was created by an asteroid, and it killed all the dinosaurs, so the scientists say. But they've also found two craters the same size in Greenland, and I look at that and go, yeah, it's called a flood. And God had to move a few things out of the way to get the water going. But what we're going to see here is destruction of life and poison waters, and it's going to be like a red tide everywhere for at least a third of the earth so that the third of the part of the sea becomes blood. Now, they also call 
asteroids, minor planets. That way they can call them, you know, like Pluto. They can say, you're a planet, and then they can turn around next week and say, no, you're not a planet anymore. But they're, man they're minor planets, and literally the International Astronomical Union, and I took a look at their latest listing, they, they're tracking thousands of these things. You can actually watch them in real time as they track them, and it's kind of like, how do we get through this without getting hit? Well, we got the moon kind of clearing a path for us, but at some point the Lord's going to, Let's let this one through. Now, one-third of all the ships, that's a lot of ships. I was curious. I said, well, how many ships are we talking about? So I went and took a look at Clarkson's Research World Fleet Monitor, okay? And as of two years ago, there were 139,300 commercial vessels currently operating with another 11,500 on order. That's a lot of ships. Inactive service, in other words, actually being used on a day-to-day -day basis are 89,000 merchant marine vessels. This is not counting naval vessels, okay, of any country. So one-third of them means that 29,667 vessels are gone. In other words, if all it did was impact into the area around Kuwait, into the, uh, the sea there, and it won't, because everything's still centered around Jerusalem, so this is going to be somewhere else on the planet. But we don't even have 29,000 vessels moving oil right now. It's only like about 9,000, 10,000 ocean-going vessels that actually move oil. So, and, and believe it or not, each of these vessels only have like 27 or 30 people on board. They're not very, very well manned in that terms. So the loss of people is only going to be about 800,000 mariners but you've just lost one-third of all of the capability to ship anything in the world just like that. They don't survive. The water turns to blood. A third of all sea life is gone. Stop and think about all the fisheries being depleted, just gone. Gone. And then all the bodies float to the surface. All I can think of is, oh, it's going to smell bad. It, it will. The destruction of the sea is going to cause upheaval to the food chain everywhere. And remember, we've already had all of the a third of the trees destroyed, all the green grass, so the planet's capability to create oxygen has already been impacted. And now we've just upset the food chain, which supports life on the planet, in terms of this second judgment that God is moving. And, and remember, God's intent is for man to repent and come to him. And not everybody's done it. Not everybody's going to come to Christ. So, so far at this point, what we see is with just the first two trumpet judgments, a third of the trees are gone, all the green grass is gone, and a third of all marine life is gone. And when I say green grass, it was green grass at that moment. Grass grows again. So the basic components of the world's food chain, at least in a third of the world, is gone. And I don't know if it's the same third or two different thirds. You know, again, Jerusalem is the center of the, of the world, and you have to assume that this destruction is not going to happen in and around Jerusalem. It might be, but it may, may not be. But when you stop and think about this destruction taking place, this is judgment on, on the planet. You know, and of course, Dr. Walford says, again, it's literal, that the life and ships that are destroyed are the ones that are near where this asteroid makes impact with the planet. Now, again... Think tsunamis, when that impacts, you're going to have these giant waves that are going to, it's all of it, all of it taking place. Today's message was in the book of Revelation. Pastor Ken has been teaching from this prophetic book here on the Unsafe Bible. You hear often about people trying to predict the end of the world or referring to some kind of apocalyptic event. But the truth is, the real apocalypse or revelation of Jesus Christ is something unlike anything else. If you know Jesus, you see these events as something that God will bring about to eventually restore things to how they were meant to be. If you view God as an enemy, you would naturally perceive the events in Revelation as some foreign enemy seeking to wreak havoc on the world and bring it to ruin. So what's the truth? If you're curious about what we believe and what our core foundation is built on, go to theunsafebible.com to learn more. 
Are you in the Jupiter, Florida area? If so, you're welcome to join us for these types of teachings in person. You'll find ways to contact us on our website so you can learn when and where we meet each week. You can also access more teachings online by going to the unsafebible.com and looking under the media tab. Catch up on any messages you've missed or listen to one you already heard as a refresher. Once again, that's the unsafebible.com. We're so glad you took the time today to hear from God and His Word. Pastor Ken has more to share from the book of Revelation, so don't miss a single edition. In the meantime, continue growing on your own in this very peculiar book of the Bible. And join us again on The Unsafe Bible.